But tonight, we're here to celebrate two local poets. Um, Deming Holleran will read first. Uh, Deming lives in Lebanon, New Hampshire, and Vero Beach, Florida, and she's been writing poems for the last 20 years. Um, she was inspired by a poetry course at Dartmouth taught by Phyllis Katz and Donald Sheehan, and wrote a collection of verse for her master's thesis. She is one of the founding members of the Still Puddle Poets, who have two collections out so far, and we're waiting for a third. Uh, Deming is a graduate of Harvard, where she met her husband, Romer, and, um, Romer? Romer. Romer, Romer. Sorry. and uh, she's an avid skier, tennis player, and golfer, and her notes on her, um, the notes that I read said that she continues to search for a way to integrate those passions into her poetry life. And when she's done with her selection, she'll turn the mic over to Laura Foley. Now, Laura currently lives in my hometown of Pomfret, Vermont, and is author of four uh, award-winning poetry collections. Her poems have appeared in numerous journals and magazines, and she just learned yesterday, the day before, that this book uh, has been uh, nominated as one of the two finalists in the Bywriters Association's third annual Bisexual Book Awards. So it's getting recognition. She holds graduate degrees in English literature from Columbia University and is a volunteer chaplain and creative arts facilitator in hospitals. And as I understand it, a newly minted certified yoga teacher. Um, so please uh, join me in welcoming our two poets, starting with Tony. Thank you, Liza. And thank you, especially for oh, thank you. Uh, for having us. It's National uh, Poetry Month this month. And it's just delightful to be able to read to so many friends. Thank you all for coming. It's uh, great to see so many familiar and some unfamiliar faces out there. Uh, I also learned on the way over that it is uh, International Guitar <coughs> Month uh, from NPR. And so I'm going to start uh, by reading the title poem, which I actually have never read in public, uh, called Gypsy Song. It's uh, kind of a reference to the fact that I do a lot of traveling, but it's also about a guitar player I met in Mexico. And um, I don't know if anybody wants to follow along in, in the book. Does anybody have a book? No, nobody has it. Well, a couple do. I can, I can say what pages these, these poems are. 70, this is. <laughs> Gypsy song, San Miguel de Allende. He looks like an El Greco come to life. Black eyes, pools of sorrow, face longer than the end of time. Yet when the gypsy, Javier, embraces his guitar, it is as though she were a woman loved, awaiting his caress. Blunt fingers of his left hand press mournful chords into her slender neck while the long nails of his other hand stroke quivering strings, coaxing them to voice. Of what do they sing? El amor y la muerte, love and death. Is that not all there is? <laughs> well, my own writing um, started, as uh, Liza referenced, about 20 years ago when I was taking a course from um, uh, Phyllis and, and Don Sheehan at Dartmouth, and uh, we started this poetry group called the Still Puddle Poets, and a bunch of them are here tonight, and I thank them especially for coming along. Uh, one impetus for my poetry was the rapid decline in my mother's health, uh, physically and mentally, which I had trouble dealing with because um, she'd always been such a vibrant personality and quite a flirt. Uh, well into her 80s, I might add. <laughs> and, and I'm kind of a rational and linear thinker, so uh, being emotionally overwhelmed was not something I was familiar with. So somehow my emotions found expression in writing particularly about my mother's decline and um, became clearer to me by the writing of poems. So here are a few examples. Elder Game on page 23. How is the mic working? Okay. 
This is something others of us might relate to. This was early on in her decline. You're a little close. Okay. I know the game that older people play, communally agreed upon, a way to circumnavigate a common word and make the exercise look less than absurd. Yet it takes decorum and etiquette to know which type of words one can forget. The skill lies in artfully concealing the momentary lapse by revealing some curious or thought-provoking feature of that mislaid name or thing or creature. You know, our friend who almost went insane after her daughter ran off with a Dane. <laughs> so why last night did it chill me right through when you couldn't recall exactly who was that horrible man in World War II? And uh, a bit later, we had my mother up to the Thousand Islands, uh, where we have a family island that we've had in the family about 80 years now. And uh, she had been going there for 50 years, as you'll hear. This is called Into the Mist. Fog shawls the island's shoulders and the silent river, where a loon call lingers in the early morning light. My mother lies in the cool bedroom of her house of 50 summers. She is nearly 88 and weary, opening her clouded eyes on one more day. I see your head propped on pillows, folds of skin thinner than the faded collar of her nightgown. We are alone, and she asks, where am I? I cannot answer. I do not really know. Her voice, my mother's voice, is high, as hollow as the loons. She leans toward me, stretching hands like sparrow talons, searching for a perch. My hands meet hers, and I am pulled down, down into the mist, into the pillowed cloud bank and the withered scent of her, and I answer from the only place that matters now. You are with me. And six months after that, keeping the watch. In my mother's room, the air weighs heavy with spirits waiting, beckoning, while she murmurs, help me, please help me. And we, I and my sisters, don't know how. We light three candles play tapes, Celtic harps, and hammered dulcimers to help ourselves. She mumbles one word for two long days before we understand, Charlie, and summon him, fellow gambler, but more importantly, a man. He chatters on, self-conscious in her absent presence, then leaving, touches her, says, goodbye, baby. That night, at last, she quiets and is gone. I had a uh, rather unusual childhood, or maybe all of us have an unusual childhood. I'm beginning to think we do. Uh, and much of it was spent on islands, Long Island, where I came from, and where Laura also came from, part of her childhood. Um, and uh, this family place in the Thousand Islands on the border of Ontario and um, New York State. And also a Thousand Acre Island in the British Virgin Islands which my father and four friends found in the 1930s and made into a getaway. I spent three weeks there every spring. So here's one from that island. It's entitled Montgomery, page five. I spent my childhood springtimes on an island in a southern sea. There, along its azure shore, grew scrubby trees dangling thick, round, shiny leaves that lovers etched with their initials. Once I too took a sharpened twig and carved a letter, uh, carved a heart enclosing a rough M. Back then, scraggly sheep and chickens eked out life before becoming dinner, and four sturdy burros trudged the uphill path laden with leather suitcases, food, and five gallon jugs of water. Early mornings before their day's work, the island boys and I would ride those steeds across the salt flat, 
pursuing bandits out beyond the ruins of an ancient sugar mill. My mount was white like the Lone Ranger's, taller than the others, with wise brown globes of eyes and a soft gray whiskered muzzle that puckered up when he grabbed my breakfast sandwich, wax paper envelope and all, and slowly gnawed it with his big square teeth. His bristled mane grew helter-skelter, barely long enough for me to clutch while lurching side to side upon his bony spine, his quick, short burrow steps, a full gallop in my mind, and I leading the posse out to rout the outlaw band. That I should love a burrow named for some brave general did not seem odd, and so I asked the grown-ups if we could marry, he and I. <laughs> they told me yes and promised us the spit of land called Monkey Point for wedding gift. <laughs> the matter might have been forgotten as burrows were replaced by jeeps and romances of a different sort. But one year, barely out of childhood, I found again the leaf that bore a heart and am. Now welted scars cracked brown and barely legible, and remembered how a girl once thought a donkey would make the perfect mate. <laughs> As my husband said the other night at a reading, that was only the first ass she wanted to marry. Uh, and a couple more from the island in the Thousand Islands. This is As the Afternoon Sun, 52. He upstaged me. <laughs> As the afternoon sun dances on the river, three sisters, naked, of a certain age, as the French would say, step gingerly down the sloping rock face into the welcoming water, bathers in a tableau vivant suggestive of Cezanne. Once we would have leapt from the swimming rock, yelping at the cold, our heads thrusting through the surface, now our sags and wrinkles settle gently into the water, where we paddle around in small circles, necks craning to keep our hair dry before dinner, <laughs> laughing at what we have become so much the same way our mother used to be. This one also from the island, as we call it, the island as though there were no other. The water snake. I saw an enormous water snake slink across my path and felt a chill as she passed. She wasn't quick. She didn't seem to care which way her torpid slither led. Her skin was like an ancient kettle, tarnished with soot, with little flecks of brown that caught the sun. I admired her rapid tongue, her clever tongue, which tasted the air for insects or danger. Neither of us saw the hired man, who had been raking leaves, raise a birch log, then slam it on her flat black head, pinning her to the ground. Her heavy body twisted, jerked, writhed, and then lay still. <clears throat> the man stood, grinning, toothless, whispered, watch this, snapped his jackknife open, and slid the blade down the snake's tawny underside. A motion caught my eye. Something thin and black and squirming squeezed through the gash and then another and another until a dozen writhing baby snakes had shimmied free and slithered into the underbrush and the mother form lay emptied like a ragged leather purse. So that one needs to be followed by a bit of levity, I think. Here's one for those of us who've lost a bunch of weight and felt utterly transformed. This is called Svelte. It's on page 31. I'd like to point out that poets have something that other writers don't in opportunity. The lines in this poem are very slim if you can see them. <laughs> she will wake craving cucumbers laced with dill rather than French toast. We'll place her feet on the floor, feel ankle bones meet knees too, no calves between. 
in the mirror, Medigliani, not Rubens, will gaze back, and the watch band will slacken at her wrist. Hip bones will rise, twin gentle hills beneath her gown. In town, slender strangers' smiles, complicit. Jeans of different cuts beckon for the fun of trying on. Passing by store windows, she'll steal sly glances at her reflection, admiring its lines. Seatbelts on a plane will need tightening. Her queen-size stockings will have to be replaced. I find that the unconscious seems to assert itself in the most curious ways, and poetry brings this out. In, in this case, a poem emerged when I started thinking about the things my husband and I tend to lose most frequently, of all other things we could be losing, and how they're unconsciously connected to larger worries. In my case, to do with eyes, because I have glaucoma and cataracts, or money concerns when the stock market tanked, or the loss of communication, as uh, we've seen with friends whose partners have uh, Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia. And um, this seems to be symbolized by a telephone. Anyway, this one's called The Little Losses. It's on page 40. It's Independence Day, and all our small belongings are claiming theirs. I think it's willful, even diabolical, the way they play at hide-and-seek. My husband's wallet loves to slip between the driver's seat and door, often just before he's amassed those masculine essentials at the hardware store, inching through a checkout line ten husbands deep. <laughs> My glasses, all eight pairs, placed with foresight next to chairs about the house, remove themselves at will. I thought I might outsmart the cell phone charging cord by buying two, but soon the coily one went missing. No doubt it has wriggled up beneath an armchair and wound itself contentedly among the springs like a baby anaconda. The other disappeared a week ago, leaving the phone bleeding like an orphaned lamb, then surfaced in my makeup. <laughs> I often wonder whether all those things that choose to go astray see themselves as signposts, gentling us along a path toward the keener pain of deeper deprivations, of the money we thought we saved, our eyesight, or even someone's whispered name. And when I wonder this, I bless the little losses for their size. At about the same time that my mother was declining physically and mentally, uh, our two youngest daughters came out as gay, one age 21 and one age 13. So this made for some more emotional grappling. Remember, this was 20 years ago uh, in New Hampshire, not in Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, strangely, I never connected this with my starting to write poems until this winter. So here's one for our youngest, Alexa, who many of you know, right out there in the audience. Coming out, page 49. It's National Coming Out Week, as though the calendar could summon reluctant birds to fly in unison like migrant geese. When I was your age, coming out meant white-frocked debutantes flocks set free from boarding school as from a dovecote fluttering gaily into society. Now coming out takes courage. Praise to you, my fledgling, who dared the changing winds so early, an eaglet slipping from the airy into flight, knowing how your wings were meant to fly. So while we're on the subject of birds, this is a poem from my backyard, a scene I hope to see replicated in the next few weeks. Um, and it is called Flight Plan, and it's on page 47. Oh, 
Oops. Softly from the hemlock falls a feathered ball of blue into my sun-flecked yard. Stunned it lies, unknown, unknowing, then fluffs itself into a baby jay and hops around as though the plunge weren't gravity's idea and finds a makeshift tree, a cedar chair with slat-spanned legs and solid seat to offer shelter from above. Within, the fledgling bobs from slat to ground to slat again until its feathers thrust outward into wings and then it flies the span. Such relentless work goes not unnoticed. Now and then, mother bird swoops down with morsels to be proffered beak to beak, then sails back up the tree and caws a plaintive parental cry about her errant child. She has other work to do. Five more feathered forms now fill the upper boughs with hops and flutterings and make the hemlock branches dance. All spring, the parent birds had swooped in with bits of debris as they built their home, then nested. But by the end of today, every chick has learned to fly and flown away. And now, so suddenly, the lively limbs are barren once again. Uh, I didn't realize when I wrote that that um, youngest daughter was about to take off for college. But I was uh, experiencing some sort of emptiness syndrome <laughs> failing. <laughs> Pre-experiencing. There's the unconscious again. Um, okay, I'd like to end with a couple I think of as love poems. Even though the intended recipient is uh, still in the sun of Florida. Uh, first is Listen to Your Heart, page 72. Last night, I heard you on the telephone counseling our daughter about a man. Listen to your heart, you said. And I thought about the doctor giving you the same advice, how you must have stepped into the pharmacy to buy the stethoscope, nonchalant, as though it were a box of, of Band-Aids or aspirin, and how that night, sitting by the fireside, we listened to your heart galloping across the prairie of your chest, reining in to pause, then pivoting and racing off again, the wind picking up, the sky so leaden you could taste the coming rain, miles off, but bearing down. And finally, the last poem in the book, called Summer Lights. Last night, I lit the lovely little lanterns you'd planted improbably among geranium beds along the terrace wall. Dangling from slender, bending stems, they lilted like phosphorescent fantasies in the evening breeze above the river, till soon one faded, and then another failed. I watched, dismayed. With easy grace, you would have stepped inside the cottage to your stash of votives and replace them as simply as I would sew a button on. A thousand times I've watched you tend the candles or wash away splashed wax from hurricane mantles to purify their gleam. Candles are what you bring to us, the good redeemed from childhood years of Catholic obligations. And my assuming your devotions feels quite wrong and so I sat there, taking in the growing darkness, mulling over all the ways one person can light another's life. Thank you. Thanks for listening. And now, Laura Foley. bookstore for hosting this event and so many other wonderful poetry and literature events. So, um, 
going to start with a poem from Night Ringing. This is a manus manuscript. And uh, I was uh, widowed about, um, in 03, and then I was single for maybe seven, eight years before I decided to try dating. And at that point, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. At that point, um, it was a little difficult because I really <coughs> didn't know whether I wanted to date um, a woman or a man. So I decided to try online dating, and actually I took out two different accounts. <laughs> um, so this, is, this um, poem is called Online Dating, and it's actually about my very first experience. <coughs> And it was a phone call. So, online dating. He's the good-looking, gray-haired guy. Briarcliff Manor widower. A photographer. Intelligent face wooing me from my monitor. We arrange a call. He entertains me with his complete medical history. <laughs> Weak heart broken ankle, enlarged prostate, <laughs> confides he pees in a bag. His late wife? Oh, last year she locked me out of the house, tore everything up, called the cops, killed herself. Now, tell me something about you. <laughs> So for a while I was, um, you know, I lived, I've always lived, I mean, I've lived up in the Upper Valley for, for um, 30 plus years. And for a while I was uh, learning to be a chaplain and, in New York City at the Zen Center. So I had to commute by, I became very intimate with the Dartmouth coach, which is, was wonderful. And had, I had many experiences. So here's one of my experiences. It's called Wild Women Do. I don't recognize her at first, this stranger become friend on the long distance coach. Our wayward exes and teenage children, her work with PTSD vets, my chaplaincy in New York. She asks if I'm divorced and when I gleefully say yes, then I mean no, then he's dead. We slide off our seats in the back of the bus, writhing with wild hilarity by the coffee tray and apples. <laughs> <laughs> so in New York City, I stayed in um, my sister's apartment. Conveniently, she didn't live there. And it was right <laughs> near <laughs> where. <laughs> so it was, it was, it actually looked into an alleyway. And if I looked up the, the, the crevice, I could see the 10th floor window, which was my bedroom when I was a child. Ghost Street. People speak of wanting to relive a day in their youth, wishing the dead alive. I look up the narrow air shaft to the windows of my childhood home, see myself in a short school frock, one ordinary evening silver candlesticks flickering the mahogany table's length, white uniformed maids bending over platters in the cavernous room, my stomach twisting as dad demands I pronounce shoe, stares at me with eyebrows raised, determined to cure my lisp, mother and sisters listening, forks suspended, I look up the narrow air shaft of my childhood home with no desire I dare pronounce. So I, um, I like to uh, write in coffee shops and um, my daughter Nina who's here um, thinks and I think she's probably right that I, I know all of the good coffee houses on the eastern seaboard. Um, queer. I sit all morning, then through lunch, 
as the cafe empties and fills. Young woman by the window stays too, cool girl I've a secret crush on, so studious with her law books. Environmental, I hear her say to someone else. I want to weave my hands through her hair, but I don't know her name. <laughs> Once I said hi as she passed and she smiled back seizing me with dumb fright, as usual, when it's someone I like. Because we're both women, I've learned this means I'm queer. I like how the word defines me, explaining a lifetime of feeling different, not wanting to flirt with guys or wear high heels. Now she's sitting with her headphones on. Just a moment ago, she yawned. <laughs> So the good news about online dating um, is that I did meet um, someone, Clara, who's here, and she's my partner. So this um, this poem is called, and she's a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is called Dinner Party. I don't know anyone here except my new partner, Clara. I haven't spoken a word in two hours, but now her lawyer colleagues discuss the hostess's mother's ashes stashed upstairs in a closet, and I think, great, I will leap in with the story of how we buried my husband in the front yard. <laughs> <laughs> Dug the hole ourselves. Yes, it's legal in New Hampshire. Yes, I got a vault. <laughs> I will sound smart, resourceful, witty, and everyone will like me. <laughs> I've been pretending I'm my quiet musician's son, thinking deep thoughts, but feeling bored and awkward, a pained smile cracking my face. Now I've missed my chance. The husband says vaults are a terrible idea <laughs> because you want the body to decompose into earth and tree roots. And I think, oh my God, I've buried him badly. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd confuse them if I did contribute since no one knows I was married, never mind widowed husband buried in the yard. <laughs> so, someone's talking cat coffins, asking maple or pine, or shiny walnut and Thai mahogany with hot pink satin lining. Someone else has a pet cemetery with wind chimes to remind them of Fluffy. Clara, shy and quiet too, smiles as I do all through dinner, though she tells me later she could have explained about ashes, the ease of letting go. Obad. Though pine trees toss all night in their feathery beds, as I do, they seem at peace where I've yet to learn to sleep with you, wondering whether your warmth keeps me awake or the stirrings of eternity. Even trees sleep in midnight air, whose stillness seems endless when you wander dream streets without me. Your wandering next to me without me teaches why the faithful fear limbo. At dawn, a bright spring junco nips suet from the feeder as you greet my waking, spring's scent rising from our snow-cold stream. So um, I, I do a lot of volunteering, um, mostly in hospitals as a kind of a chaplain um, or doing creative arts. But I decided to try um, doing a little other kind of, of volunteering. And this is with uh, the Recover group. So this is called The Poet Volunteers. Any carpentry experience? Don't worry, we'll teach you everything. They fit me with a heavy leather belt, measuring tape, fat wrench sagging my waist. Stooping, I follow five men into the dark, cramped understory of a listing house, moldy walls, too close ceiling. As they explain the job, my eyes seek the far-off exit hole, a tiny eye of sunlight not meeting mine. 
Trying not to imagine beams caving in, I fasten on his words. Did you say sistering the boards? But feel faint, hearing the tragic calls my children will receive, kitchen collapsed on my head. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be fine, the foreman promises, leading me out, pairing me with a handsome young mason who encourages, there must be a poem in this, teaching me to slap wet goo on bricks, leave my fingerprints on seams of stone. <laughs> So this poem is actually the title poem. Um, the book is Joy Street, and um, the poem is called No GPS Necessary. <laughs> I love you, I say, as we leave the hotel room, as we take the elevator down and stroll city blocks to the hospital, as we walk the antiseptic corridors, and she's wheeled away as I return to Joy Street where yesterday she said those words to me. So, you know the gelato place in Hanover? Pretty good. It's called gelato. She buys me gelato, my favorite, but eats it on the way home. <laughs> It was so cold, so delicious, coffee sweet cream. I'm so sorry, she says <laughs> with a kiss and hands me the empty dish. <laughs> so um, I recently saw the movie Unbroken, and now I'm reading the book. And um, my father was a, um, a prisoner of war in Japan for four years. Hindsight. I happen after the photo of my emaciated father standing on a ship's deck, dark hair combed neatly to the right. He's just endured four years of war, POW for the Japanese, starved, waterboarded. One feature commands our attention. My partner names it his survivor eyes, just like mine. So this poem goes back to when I was a new mother, and um, I have to read it because Aaron's here. Yeah. My oldest son is here. Maternal semiotics. And you, you all have to guess who the famous author is in this poem. I'll ask you afterwards. <laughs> Maternal semiotics, that's a clue. It was only eight weeks, but I missed the world since becoming a mother. So I bundled the baby up, took him to hear a lecture in the grand hall at my alma mater. I wore a fashionable gray wool cape, which worked for my furtive purpose. The famous writer lectured on semiotics, physics, Italian roses, background noise muffled by sounds of sucking, unparsed poetry rising from my breasts. Okay, who knows? No? Umberto? Oh. <laughs> Umberto Echo. It goes back to the mid 80s. Not humming. On the forced march from Tin Sin to Wu Sung, our Marines ordered silent. No humming or singing snapped the Japanese as the men trudged a hundred miles to prison my father not humming the whole of four winters, or to my knowledge, since. Drift. I eye roll Aunt Lizzie, who can't see me over the phone. Tell her, I'm dating a woman now. But at 90, she's adrift in uncharted seas till I say, we may marry. And she crests the wave, her kind old voice soothing, oh, but Laura, you're still attractive to men. <laughs> <laughs> Grasping the rudder with practiced hands. <laughs> A 
good life. I didn't realize I was a stay-at-home mom, but knew I didn't know how to get a job, English lit degree, my kids full of need and fun, the best I could have done, I know now they're grown. Um, so um, I have to read this uh, as a, here we are in the Upper Valley and um, just remembering Grace Paley. So this is called Grace. The famous white-haired poet orders for a group, frappuccinos, mochas with skim milk, double soy lattes. The young barista gets confused, scribbles hurried notes. The poet rests a worn, compassionate hand on her youthful shoulder, letting her know she has all the time she needs to breathe. I await my turn, thinking I'd like to be like her. Not the famous part, the graceful part. So um, I'd like to read this recent poem, which harks back to the time when my um, we, we my family, my children, and three children, and husband and I um, we were sort of known as the traveling sharfs. I mean, we really lived all over the world and traveled all over the world. So this is a story. Um, Nina is nine or eight, so eight, twelve, sixteen, three children and we're in Venezuela. Herculean. We weather the rough waves together as the excursion boat takes its beating, and I attempt to soothe us reading Aeneid, loud enough to drown the pounding out. When I read the chapter where Polynorus falls from the ship, I realize it too late. <laughs> Continuing to the underworld where we meet Polynurus dead. Arriving at the coral bed at last, the captain gestures for us to jump in, in a language I do not understand, as he abandons my three young children and me to bob in deep water, attempting to snorkel, but the coral has faded due to overfishing, and I don't know where our ship has gone. <laughs> We're far from Margarita's white sand beaches, where my husband, past 80, nurses a torn Achilles, and I begin to understand my future. <laughs> and I'd like to close. So it's Earth Day. I thought, well, everything is about the Earth. I mean, um, but this poem does have some real earth. Uh, and it's a poem in nine parts. It's called Nine Ways of Looking at Light. And it's from a new manuscript called It's This. One, we moved the bed so the head faces north, a wisdom we read from India. We dislodged a ghost, her husband, who on these sheets three years ago expired. We altered the angle of our repose and sleep all night at peace entwined. We wake to morning hills, trees, a great expanse, a gentle dappled light new to us. Two, the patient avoids the hospital window's view turning from snow's glare and stripped winter trees, focusing on photos of dogs, children, his hunting awards taped to the wall, all invoking home where he'd prefer to be, this large man with his bright white beard, who doesn't read much, doesn't pray, except now with me, both of us shy, until his eyes tear and his body shines from inside. Three. No dappling leaves, but enough snow on near branches now to illuminate our window, winter light grown greater with snow's reflection. Four. We begin it with experiment, hurling boiling water to the frozen air, watching it glitter like glass confetti crackling in the new year, an answered wish in every shining shard. Five, cold wind whips snow 
so it swirls around our tallest pine, a halo of light circling, a frigid angel or ghost from my or someone else's past, seeking company, or just floating in the crisp winter air for the wonder of it. Six. Not brown, not rust, but inexplicably white as bones, these remnants, dry as dust, recall life, crackling as wind shivers them in barren early spring. Not one bud yet gracing it. White leaves clung through snow and ice to shine and tremble in this Sunday light. Seven. The dog shivers, wet from a late spring swim, whimpers as the wind pulls light from the pond and we sit in shadows by the water she knows just last summer shone gold. Eight. This sip of coffee over so quickly, this guiding lighthouse in the mistless harbor, moments before the season changes, this slip of wind along the bay, a sweater saving me from chill, this precious slant of summer sun, clouds arriving to veil the light, a gentle voice of waves on stone, it's this, it's this, it's this. Nine, I walk this foggy dawn to see the seals where they sleep beneath the scrim rain makes of rising light, to hear the music of their steady breath, a holy time before the changing of the tide. Thank you for listening.